Hello everybody, my name is Harriet Holmes and I am a member of Wilberforce Chambers and I'm here with Casper Bartschera who is my colleague, another member of Wilberforce Chambers. Um, I am 2011 call and I'm a member of Chambers Pupillage Committee. Casper is one of our most recent um, tenants having been in Chambers for 12 months and experienced our pupillage process. So what we're going to talk to you about over the next 20 minutes is a little bit about um, what you, life might be like at the Chancery Commercial Bar, which is the area of work that Chambers is focused on and the members practice in. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Chambers and finally um, touching on what you can expect from a Wilberforce pupillage if you were to get one um, and what the experience of being involved in a Wilberforce pupillage might be like. So, Moving swiftly on then to hopefully keep things a bit interesting for you over the next um, 20 minutes or so, um, we're going to talk first about what, what Chancery commercial work actually is, because we expect that many of you have probably heard quite a lot about what life at the commercial bar might be like, um, with some of the disputes that the pure commercial sets do, but we at Wilberforce are not quite like that. Um, we do Chancery commercial work, which is a much broader spectrum of work. And Casper, do you want to chip in with giving us a bit of a flavour of what Chancery Commercial is like? Absolutely, Harriet. So um, the really interesting thing at Wilberforce is that we do um, that we do work in a range of genuinely specialist areas that are nonetheless often connected. So we do um, what traditional Chancery and trusts work, which um, nowadays tends to involve a lot of offshore work in um, the Caribbean and also in um, say Guernsey or Jersey, um, as well as working together with teams all across the globe, really. We also do a fairly trusty area of work, albeit that it is um, largely complemented by statute and pensions work. And um, we then do um, a number of other things as well. So we do property, um, which obviously doesn't need any explanation. And, and in, in this context, I'm talking about real property rather than um, sort of personal property. Um, and then we do insolvency work and um, last but by no means least, um, commercial work. And um, with the commercial work, for instance, there's a lot of overlap actually with the trust work in that often commercial cases that members of chambers are involved in are um, what are sometimes described as civil fraud cases or other commercial cases that have a strong um, equity angle. So um, as you will be familiar with from your studies, um, there are a number of duties that are incumbent um, on say company directors that um, have an equitable background. And um, there are often cases involving those sort of duties that um, require specialist chancery expertise, which we are able to bring to the table. I mean, I don't know about you, Casper, but I think it's fair to say that for me, the kind of big distinction between the sort of work that you do in Wilberforce compared to, say, at a pure commercial set is that um, we're not just dealing with kind of contractual issues all the time and sort of and straight com commercial contractual disputes. Um, so much of what we're doing is bringing in a whole variety of different areas of law. I mean, speaking for myself as a property practitioner, for example, um, you know, or most cases that I um, work on have a statutory element, possibly statutory overlay. So there's some black letter read, um, statutory interpretation there. It, there is usually a contract in the form of either a development agreement or um, the lease or the conveyance. Um, and there is then also kind of often tortious um, elements if the claim is based in tort um, and I have to look at guarantees, I have to think about equitable principles. So all the time I get the opportunity to bring that sort of variety in it and, and also to um, experience the intellectual challenge of working across that variety of law and sort of solving difficult problems. Um, I suppose the other thing I think we said we were going to talk a little bit about is kind of what, what the work looks like in Chambers. So um, in Wilberforce, I don't know if you've come across us before, those of you who are listening or watching, um, but we work in some of the most complex, most high profile of cases that are litigated in the country and also in other jurisdictions. So to give you a flavor, members of our Chambers have been involved in the decade long multi-billion um, dollar dispute in called the Saad litigation. 
Um, and you know that case is kind of coming to its end now, but it was a very well-known high profile case because of the complexity of it and um, the, the value of it. Um, and that was a case based out of the Cayman Islands. Um, incidentally, the Court of Appeal um, panel in the Cayman Court of Appeal um, comprised also a member of Chambers. So um, we have some really interesting um, cases that we look at. In the property sphere, for example, there was, some of you may have heard the European Ma Medicines Agency case, which was all about whether Elise had been frustrated. Well, it was a full um, suite of Wilberforce. That um, was by Brexit, case. right? Whether it had been frustrated by Brexit. So it, exactly. was a, it was a sort of legal problem that everybody was talking about for a while. Exactly. And it was so, you know, it, and we had, a, as I said, both sides are represented by a silks and juniors in chambers. So um, there was that sort of amusing dynamic as well of having the internal um, uh, battle um, and etc. So and then, I mean, the, for example, again, speaking for myself, I've been in the Court of Appeal twice this year in some very interesting um, property cases. And other members of chambers have been sort of up in the Supreme Court or dealing with some complex appellate work. So we really do, I think, get to see some of the most technically and intellectually stimulating cases. Has that been your experience so far, Casper, as a new tenant? Oh, and entirely. Sadly, in my um, in my one year in practice, I have not yet had um, the privilege of going to the Court of Appeal, although my co-pupil who started at the same time as me, Lemuel, did go to the Court of Appeal earlier this year. So it's by no means an impossibility. Um, it will come. It will come. But on on that note, then, so we talked a little bit about the work and uh, the variety of it and um, the intellectual stimulation of it. But what about how have you found Chambers to be as a place to work sort of culturally? And, um, you know, what do you think of our ethos? Oh, you know, everybody is just absolutely brilliant. And I mean that in, in two ways. Um, <laughs> on the one hand, everybody is really very clever, which is um, you know, actually very exciting. It's, it's, a, it's a delight to work with other people who um, clearly care about their work so deeply and um, um, are really sort of at the top of their game, um, to use a much um, used phrase. Um, but uh, on the other hand, on the other side of, um, of it as well, um, everybody is genuinely actually so lovely and um, has done such a wonderful job of um, of making me and I, I would hope everybody in Chambers um, feel so, so very welcome. Um, you know, it started during pupillage um, with um, junior members of Chambers sort of regularly checking in on me, taking me and Lemuel out for lunch and um, drinks and so forth. And, um, you know, it's, it's continued into my first year in practice with genuinely everyone's door being open all the time. Um, which has been very valuable um, because quite frankly, starting out in practice is somewhat daunting and there you will come across situations you haven't had to consider before. And so having the ability of um, um, knocking on the door or making a call on teams more frequently these days um, of um, somebody more experienced than you who might've had to consider the same problem before um, has been, so incredibly um, helpful, and I've I've, I've really um, felt very at home in chambers um, right from the outset of pupillage. I can I can completely relate to that. I you know as you know, Casper, I'm not a homegrown Wilberforcer. I moved to chambers four years ago from a different set, and my my other my previous set was lovely. But one of the things that really um, was so immediately apparent to me when I joined Wilberforce is just the the sort of sheer fizzing. Um, intellectual brilliance of the people you're surrounded by can be really infectious and very exciting. It can be a really fabulous place to work in that regard. And you can have all kinds of interesting, stimulating conversations, not always about the, um, the cases that you're working on. There's normally um, something interest interesting to be discussed. And um, you're sort of getting assistance from people um, as you're um, you know, developing at the very beginning of your tenancy, it works all the way through chambers. You know, there are sometimes even silks that will come and talk to me about a problem and I will do vice versa. So there is this kind of constant exchange of ideas and debate, which is, uh, yeah, makes for a very exciting place to be. So having then um, had a chat, oh, sorry, what were you gonna say? 
<laughs> yeah, Harriet, I was I was going to move us on to the next topic. Actually. <laughs> well done. So sorry for interrupting <laughs> you there, but um, no, it's all right. I, I I did want to ask you um, because um, obviously I've experienced it, but I'm I've not seen it from from the other side, from the pupillage committee, and I'm I'm sure um, those who are considering joining us would be interested to learn um, how the pupillage is structured from the view of the pupillage committee. I, I, I'll gladly add some um, some sprinkles of experience yeah. of what it's actually like to do pupillage at the end, but I think it's important for everybody to um, sort of hear what yeah, yeah, the process and the thinking behind the process is. So I think I'll I'll come on to the structure of the pupillage in a second, but just to kind of make clear to those who are listening that our application process and how we go about sort of the, our pupillage policy is all available on our website. And we like to think that we're really quite transparent about um, what we're doing and what we're thinking about. Um, so, but equally, if you have any questions about the application process, um, there's an email address that you can utilise to sort of ask, ask our pupillage administrator, who will probably get a member of the committee to look at the question. Um, so there's loads of information on the website. So we are just going to focus on really the structure of pupillage, which is really this. So pupillage is a, is a 12 month training process. We offer a 12 month pupillage. Um, one of the things that kind of marks us out from some other sets is that we have what we call a non-practicing 12 months. So um, the for at least the first nine months of your pupillage, you will be working with your supervisor on their cases um, and not doing any work in your own right. Um, the reason for that is because we've got quite a lot of different areas of work that are looked at in chambers and we want pupils to really experience all of those areas so that when they go into tenancy, um, which we'll we, I'll come back to this, but we recruit with a view to tenancy. So we very much see our pupils as future members of chambers as long as they meet the standard. Um, but the idea is that you get along that for nine months, the opportunity to really learn and experience our areas. Then once the decision is taken at the nine month mark as to whether you're going to be offered tenancy or not, um, for the remaining three months, there will be opportunity for you to accept instructions in your own right and ease your way into tenancy while still having a pupil supervisor supervising you full time. In terms of um, what happens in that first nine months, which is really the meat of the pupillage when you're being assessed, you're going to probably have about four seats. You will sit with four different supervisors, therefore. Um, who will work across a mix of chambers areas of work. And the idea is to give each and every pupil the opportunity to experience those different areas. We're very keen to ensure that pupils are being assessed in a way that is comparable. So we will also, during that nine months, give a, a pupil a couple of assessed pieces of work to do, which are sort of centralised, they're centrally set papers, essentially, that are given to each and every pupil, because it's our way of making sure that we're being fair and treating everybody equally. Um, you will also have a couple of advocacy um, exercises, um, which are peppered throughout the nine months. Um, the idea behind those is to really, partly for us to check that you have that skill set as a pupil, but it's also there to sort of help continue developing your advocacy skills. So you'll get loads of feedback after the first advocacy assessment. And the idea is that we want to see a trajectory and we want to see that by the second exercise, you've kind of improved your advocacy skills um, and you'll get a whole load of feedback again that time um, on that second occasion as well. In terms of pupillage as a whole, what we're looking for is we are mainly assessing intellectual and analytical ability. That's our sort of that's the criterion that we attach a significant amount of weight to because of the intellectual academic nature of the work that we do. Um, and we're assessing you based on there being a trajectory. We want to see that as you move through your nine months, you're just getting better and better and developing the skills. So in a sense, um, it's a stressful year, but it's also a year where you can expect to be given lots of feedback. You can expect to be told how you're doing and there will be a six month kind of discussion where there will be feedback that works both ways to discuss sort of how you're doing to you know check in that you're on the tra trajectory we don't want to get to nine months and for you to be really surprised if we end up and we hope we don't have to do it saying you know sorry you're not going to be offered tenancy the idea is that you should have a fairly good idea throughout the process 
how you're doing and um, whether it's likely for you to that you're going to be offered tenancy. But that's enough about the structure, I think, unless you want to add anything, Casper. But I'm interested in hearing from you what it was like, given that you experienced the whole thing quite recently. Uh, yes, although it, it does seem like a lifetime ago now, um, <laughs> after my very short 12 months of practice. Um, I think um, the, the one thing I would stress to prospective applicants is that um, pupillage is inherently a pretty stressful time. And um, what, I, what I would say about pupillage the Wilberforce is that there is, um, there's absolutely no attempts made to make it any more stressful than it needs to be. And in fact, through the sort of um, very structured and transparent process that Harriet has just outlined, um, I think Chambers does a great deal to make it less stressful than it could otherwise be. So, you know, you're told from the outset um, what's going to count for what. Um, you're told that, you know, your supervisor's views are paramount, so you don't sort of spend a week before the advocacy um, exercise, which is really just that, an exercise, um, stressing out about how this, you know, 20 minutes of performance is going to impact the next 30 years of your career. Um, and um, sing, um, similarly, um, our head of pupillage, Martin, um, stressed um, several times to both um, Lemuel and me, and I'm sure to um, other sets of pupils before and after that, um, that what Wilberforce really is looking for is excellent work. So um, the way he put it is, um, you know, we want to, we, we'd much rather have a slow A than a um, fast B. So, um, <laughs> you know, you are given the time to, um, to really bottom out any problems, which is um, a massive luxury that often you won't have in practice. But um, I think it is a really important contributor to making sure that, you know, everybody can um, sort of shine their brightest during pupillage and so um, has the best chance possible to really get taken on a tenancy. And I do is... think that in that respect, our record does speak for itself. We've, we've taken on the vast majority of tenants in um, as long as I'm aware anyway. Um, uh, I think that's I think that's right. And I mean, one of the things that I'm, you know, ever so slightly envious of as someone who's kind of come in from the outside and my co-pupil -co therefore was elsewhere, is that what I think does mark out the, the fact that we're recruiting with a view to tenancy um, does mean that the pupils are not in competition with each other. And so there are some really firm friendships that get formed between co-pupils who are also able to support each other through the process so here we are sort of assessing you but actually you get to kind of support and help each other and you know I know that my contemporaries at around my level of call in in chambers you know I, you can identify the the duos that were um pupils together um because they are really really good friends um and and that's just a really kind of nice extra that you get from our process it seems to me Yes, and the, I mean, the fact that although the standard is um, competitive, there's no competition between pupils is hugely important because, you know, um, it, it, it would be very stressful to have to con constantly compare yourself to your co-pupil who by all likelihood is going to be exceptionally brilliant. And so um, it's, it's really actually very, very important that um, that is not the case and I found it hugely helpful. I think um, that no I'm, I'm really glad to hear it I mean I think just to sort of close this off um, what I'd say to my kind of little um, final message to those that have listened all the way through to this would be that if you think you want to really use your brain um, Ha experience an intellectual challenge and be really solving some quite difficult legal problems you know each and every day um, in your working life and you would like to do that in an environment that is um, you know quite a, a, a friendly but exciting place to work then you really ought to think about applying for a mini pupillage with us um, or sort of try and find another way to find out a bit more about Wilberforce and consider applying to us for pupillage because I don't think I've ever felt that I'm uh, in the wrong job or in the wrong place because my aims are always to do something that meant I could use my brain. Um, and, you know, I can't think of a better place from which I can do that. Um, what's What would be your last message, <laughs> final message rather, Casper, to those listening? 
Um, I'm I'm not sure I can really improve on that elevator pitch. <laughs> um, Good. I think maybe we will we'll leave your words hanging in the room. Um, <laughs> Good. Brilliant. Well, thanks all for tuning in or listening to what we had to say. And hopefully we'll be seeing lots of lovely applications for the forthcoming mini privileges from you. Um, oh, yes. Um, on that. Um, yeah, I think the deadline is um, in early November for the next round. So um, these will be taking place. Um, we hope in person. Is that right? Yes. And it's either the 8th or the 9th of November that the deadline is. You can find out more about it on the website as it's ever. It's the 8th of November, but please bear in mind that there are four sessions that we hold over each year. Um, and if we end up with a flood of applicants for the first one, um, don't be disappointed if you don't get a place. It might be that you just need to apply for one of the subsequent sessions. Um, but yes, four sessions and there's loads of information on our website. Um, hope, we hope you found this really helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.